I am Moraine Sedai. Twenty years ago, I learned a secret. A vision of a baby being born. A baby who could change the world. In the last age, the Dark One was trapped by the last dragon at the cost of almost everything. Twenty years ago, the last dragon was reborn. Welcome to the Wheel of Time, a series that, as its name suggests, takes on the concept of time as cyclical. That being the case, it can be assumed that the story is set in a remote past, but also in a distant future, as the wheel turns and ages come and pass. On one of those, called the Age of Legends, humanity lived in a highly advanced society, achieved through the use of the One Power, the energy that drives the universe itself. Saidin and Saidar are the male and female halves of the power, respectively. The men and women, able to wield it, were called the Aes Sedai, the servants of all, who led mankind to great works and the time of bliss, until, searching for a new source of power, they drilled the bore into the very fabric of reality, and by a twist of fate, they released an evil entity from its prison. They called it the Dark One, to avoid its real name, Shaitan, the adversary of the creator of the world, who imprisoned it at the beginning of time. Once unleashed, evil found its way into the world and corruption spread. Many people turned to the Dark One and became known as Dark Friends. Some of the most powerful Aes Sedai switched sides too and became known as the Forsaken. War ensued until the leader of the Aes Sedai, Luz Therin Telamon, also referred to as the Dragon, gathered a hundred companions and managed to seal the Dark One again, but not without cost. As retaliation, in the last moment, the Dark One tainted Saedin, the male half of the One Power, forever condemning men who could channel to hopelessly descend into madness. This proved to be disastrous, for hundreds of male Aes Sedai, suddenly victims of madness, ravaged the world with the One Power, bringing about a cataclysm that reshaped the face of the Earth later known as the Breaking of the World. Luz Therin, the dragon himself, taken by the taints, slaughtered his own family, after which, stricken with grief beyond all measure, he channeled as much of the One Power as he could and committed suicide, creating an explosion so strong that it caused a volcanic eruption that formed a mountain, one of the tallest of the world, which received the name of Dragon Mount. With the death of the last male channeler, the breaking came to an end and this marked the beginning of what is called the Third Age by some. Civilization slowly began rebuilding, although everything reverted back thousands of years, technologically and culturally. The eyes had I regrouped, but from now on with the ranks consisting fully of women. They built their new stronghold in the island of Tarvalon by the shadow of Dragon Mount, and under their guidance humanity tried to thrive again, preparing for the reappearance of the dragon, that according to prophecy would be reborn at the end of times to fight the last battle against the Dark One when it finally breaks from its prison. He is born again, I feel him. The dragon takes his first breath on the slope of Dragon Mount. He is coming, he is coming. Light helpers, light help the world. He lies in the snow and cries like the thunder. He burns like the sun. Outside the walls of Tarvalon, a young soldier called Landman Dragoran is surveying his troops before a battle, the last in a long war that is finally about to end. He deploys his 300 men on a low ridge to contain the attack of a people called the Aiel. But when this Aiel army, 2,000 strong, recognized Lan, they salute him and retire from battle, returning to their lands. This show of respect connects with Lan's mysterious past that will be unraveled throughout the book. Inside the White Tower of Tarvalon, a 22-year-old Moraine Damodred and a 20-year-old Juan Sanchez are introduced. They are accepted, the stage prior to becoming full as a die, but above playing novices of the tower. They stand in the study of Tamraus Peña, the Amberlin seat, leader of the Aes Sedai. Moraine handles a cup of tea to Gitara Moroso, the Keeper of the Chronicles, title given to the second-in-command below the Amerlin. 
As she does so, the latter stands up, looking forward in terror, and has a foretelling, a prophetic viewing of the imminent birth of the Dragon Reborn in Dragon Mount. Immediately after, she falls dead at Moraine's arms. Tamra makes Moraine and Swan swear they won't tell anybody. Even if they must lie, to which they both agree, they go back to Swan's room to practice for their upcoming test to be full as they die, and we learn about their friendship that they also share with Morel, another accepted. Soon after, all girls in the accepted rank are summoned to receive orders to leave the tower and travel through the area surrounding Tarvalon, collecting the names of all the women that have given birth on the last days, making sure they get the name, gender and place of birth of the infants. All of this with the goal, unbeknownst to the accepted, of finding the Dragon Reborn. Moraine and Swan leave for the camps and start taking the names of the children. After just one day of work, the Amarlin exempts Moraine from going, with the excuse of the recent death of her uncle Laman, king of the realm of Kyrian. Instead, she will be copying with good calligraphy the most unreadable lists. Swan is to assist her. They start taking the names of boys, most likely to be the dragon, on their personal notebooks. In doing so, Moraine is interrupted several times by Aes Sedai wanting to know who, within House Damodred, can ascend to the throne of Kyrian after Laman's death, and if she would be willing to be queen, which causes her nightmares. Tamra gathers a selected group of trusted Aes Sedai to search for the Dragon Reborn and keep him hidden, if found, since she doesn't trust the Red Aja. The Ajas are seven subgroups in which the Aes Sedai are divided, each one dedicated to a specific purpose. The Red focuses on punishing the wrong use of the One Power, mainly through capturing male channelers and cutting them off from the power, but also eradicating any group of female channelers outside the tower. Their hatred towards men is what causes Tamra's distrust. The Green Aja prepares for battle against the Dargun. They are usually great generals and strategists. The Grey focuses on diplomacy and mediation in politics. The Brown Aja's work is to gather and preserve all kinds of knowledge. The Yellow Aja studies the art of healing. The Blue Aja pursues causes of justice and righteousness. And the White Aja focuses on logic and philosophy. Beyond these, rumors of the existence of another, the Black Aja, dedicated to serve the Dark One, exist among the common people, but are never spoken openly to Aes Sedai, who deny this fiercely. Every sister wears a shawl that works as a sign that they are Aes Sedai, each one showing the color of her Aja. Elaira, a newly raised Red Sister, forces Swan and Moraine to practice for the test under unusual strain and crosses the line, hurting them. She gets punished for this, thus forging an everlasting enmity with both girls. After that, Moraine finally takes the test for the shawl. Elaira tries to make her fail through cruel obstacles, but she is able to overcome them. Swan passes too, and the girls decide to celebrate, playing a prank to Elaira. They place mice in her bed, but they are caught in the act and taken to Miriam, the mistress of novices, for punishment. The next day, they take the racing ceremony. Tamra hands them the Oath Road, a magic device that binds every Aes Sedai to three oaths. Swear your oath, Moraine Sedai. I swear to speak no word that is not true. To make no weapon with which one person may kill another. And never to use the One Power as a weapon. The newest member of the Blue Aja, Lian, puts the shawl on Moraine's shoulders and welcomes her. We learn they were friends as accepted, and now that they are all Aes Sedai, they can resume their friendship. That will be important in the future especially for Swan. They are taken to the Blue Aja quarters, where they are taught Aes Sedai customs, through which we readers learn all Aes Sedai have to differ to a sister stronger in the One Power, and never refer to it openly, nor their age. Swan is taken as assistant to the headmistress of the network of Blue Aja spies, while Moraine is put to a different task. The tower wants her to ascend as Queen of Kyrian, which she dislikes fervently, but a few days later everything changes when Tamra dies mysteriously. Moraine, although she admired Tamra, 
takes the opportunity to ask the new Amerlin to be relieved of her task, but she is rebuked and orders to remain in the tower. Left with no choice, she flees, taking a ship to the borderlands, the kingdoms to the north, bordering the line of lands taken by the corruption of the Dark One. She travels interviewing the mothers of the babies in her notebook, looking for the dragon reborn. Her search takes her to Canelon, a town in the kingdom of Kandor, where she finds a group of Aes Sedai in the same inn in which she is staying. Meanwhile, Lan is back to the borderlands, after watching the Aeel retreat from battle. When passing through Canelon, he receives news concerning his past that keeps haunting him. From this point onwards, Lan and Moraine's paths get closer and closer until they intertwine and the novel follows their journey from the moment they meet until they are ready to begin their quest of finding the Dragon Reborn, quest that will eventually lead them to the two rivers at the beginning of the main series. The leader of the Aes Sedai group in Canlon is Kalswain Meladrin, a legendary Aes Sedai thought to be dead on retirement, but who came back to the forefront despite her age. She's gonna become a very important character in the main series, and her presence here, although minor, is one of my reasons to advise you to read New Spring only after Book 7, when she's properly introduced. Kalswain tries to force two sisters to accompany Moraine in her travels, in her words, not to let the young Aes Sedai do anything dumb. But that very same night, Moraine meets Swan in Canlum, who also fled Tarvalon to give her the terrible news that all of Tamra's searchers are dead. Swan has proof that one of the searchers did not die in bed of old age, as was officially announced, and that added to the fact that the Amberlin's death, followed by that of all of her trusted sisters, cannot be coincidence, is evidence enough to conclude that the Black Aja is real and it's behind these actions. Not knowing whether Katswain is Black Aja or not, Swan flees Kanlom immediately, headed for Chachin, the capital city of Kandor, where the next baby boys in the list are. Moraine will follow the next day, not to arouse suspicions. On the way to Chachin, she spots some men ahead of her, which are no other than Lan, a friend of his named Ryan, and Bukama, his mentor. She follows them for a while, until she sees one of them leave the road and get into the forest to the side. She follows the man, who turns out to be Lan, and finds him sitting alone by a pond of water. She tries to snatch his sword away, but he's aware of her presence, and moving quickly, he grabs her and throws her to the cold water of the pond. The sudden shock puts the one power out of her reach, but Lan offers help to get her out. After presenting herself as an Aes Sedai to the three men, they agree to escort her to Tachin, trying to remain undercover. Here we see Moraine start using the pen name Lady Alice, which she will use frequently later on. Once in Tachin, they part ways. Lan presents himself in the royal palace and is received with honor by a whole group of people from Malkir, a former nation of the Borderlands that fell prey to the Dark One. For those not afraid of spoilers, it is revealed that Lan is the last heir to the throne of Malkir, and here he finds Lady Edin, his first lover, who plans to marry him to her daughter Isel to proclaim him as king of Malkir. Meanwhile, Moraine reunites with Swan and devises a plan to infiltrate the palace, but once inside, she learns of the presence of Mirian there. Worried about the mistress of novices being Black Aja, she finds Lan and asks him for help spying on her. Surprisingly, not only Mirian was indeed Black Aja, but Ryan, Lan's friend, was a dark friend at her service. So much so that he doesn't hesitate and kills Bukama when he catches him spying. Thus, the final showdown comes forward in the royal palace of Chachin. Moraine and Lan rush to confront Mirian and Ryan, and after a fierce battle, they manage to defeat them but not before the Black Aes Sedai kills Dirik, son of the Queen of Kandor, since the Black Aja thought there was the slightest possibility of him being the Dragon Reborn. Isel, Lady Edin's daughter, is also killed, ending her mother's plan of crowning Lan, before it even started. Afterwards, Moraine and Swan part ways, 
The first will resume the search for the boy and the other will go back to Tarvalon and take back her job as assistant to the Mistress of Spies so that she can keep Moraine updated on news about both the Black Aja and the dragon's whereabouts. On the outskirts of Chachin, Moraine finds Lan, who seemed to have lost all will to live, since all of his most close people died. The young Aes Sedai convinces him to join her, since her quest to find the Dragon Reborn is the best way she can think of to help Lan on his personal war against the Dark One. Lan swears an oath to follow and protect Moraine, and she weaves the One Power, bonding him as her warder. The last we see of them is the pair hitting the road off to the world with the task of finding the Dragon Reborn in time, before the Dark One does. I want to thank especially my friend Claire for voicing Jitara's foretelling. And as always, if you like this content, please like and subscribe and I'll see you in the next video.